I'd like to call the Committee of the Whole for Monday, May 13th, 2019 to order. My name is Alderman Richard Marks. I, with Alderman Clements, represent the Second Ward. Um, we have a number of presentations tonight, and I think, Mayor, you, you will probably start off. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our, our first item of business is to uh, recognize a police officer as being promoted this evening, and I would like to invite our friend uh, Chris Reading to the podium. Mr. Reading? Thank you. And I'm not responsible for this, okay, at this point. <laughs> oh, well, Officer Reading commented that when you were sworn in as a police officer, I was traveling, and you had Alderman Maladra Sorry. preside. No, it was good. It was good. And remember, you sent me that email saying, who is Maladra? Right. <laughs> no. You have a fan base with you this evening. I do. Would you like to introduce your special guests? Uh, I have my father, my daughter, Carly, my son, Knox, my mother, and my wife, Lindsay. <clears throat> Carly and Knox. Correct. Okay. The name Knox, man. Where does that come from? Just liked it. It's, it's nothing. I've never heard of it. It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Will he get a full ride to Knox College? And... <laughs> I, I'd have to ask. <laughs> Maybe they'll tune in. Maybe. So how long have you been on board, officer? Uh, seven and a half years here. That was a year previous with another department. Right. And uh, what town do you claim your home? Uh, well, I, I grew up here, uh, so I guess this is always home. I don't currently reside here, but... And, and you graduated fun. Geneva High School, may I ask what year? 2005. 2005. Those were good years, weren't they? They were. Yeah. Is there a statue of you at the high school? <laughs> the, big, the big Viking out front? Is that no, the one? No, I was, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was thinking of something more like in the men's restroom. <laughs> <laughs> so after high school, what did you do? I uh, went to Western Illinois, studied criminal justice which is really the premier institution in the state yes for building developing cops correct and you always knew you wanted to be a police officer i wouldn't say always it was probably freshman and sophomore year that i kind of really started honing in on that what was the uh bell in the head that said you know what i'm gonna do this uh i don't know there wasn't there wasn't a single thing um i think to be honest when it, when i first you know, the driving fast, the lights, the excitement. Uh, That's encouraging. That was, <laughs> that, was the, that was the first thing that, that kind of attracted me to it. And Could have volunteered, for God's sake, for ESDA or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't let them drive. That's true. So seven and a half years. So mm -hmm. far, so good. Yep, very good. And uh, how's, uh, how's the family take it? Great. Yep. Yep. Yeah, everything is good. Supportive. Uh, fortunately, I have the ability to, to let my wife be a mom, uh, so That's she nice. gets to stay home and with our kids. And Absolutely. Things great. Uh, Dad, what did you do that helped build this young man to what he is today? Um, you know, I taught him his golf swing is a very valuable tool. <laughs> <laughs> what is your handicap, officer? Uh, it's hard to say now because I, I work. I don't. Get a lot, I get out, get out a lot, but uh, at its peak, it was it was scratch. <clears throat> well, we still have the front page picture of reading shoots back to back birdies against eagles or eagles. Or? I'm sorry, back to back eagles against Batavia. Against Batavia. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's right. Now, did did mom and dad have to pay for that article to be in, kind of like Lori Laughlin or no? No, luckily, uh, <laughs> we, we had uh, Dave Hewn, who, uh, who wrote the sports articles, and, and Mitch was one of my teammates. So. Oh, that's cool. What was your best round? Uh, 65. Really? What course? Uh, Blackberry Oaks in Yorkville. That's a putt-putt course. <laughs> <laughs> the windmill and the clown and everything, yep. Congratulations. <laughs> that's exciting. What's your favorite set of clubs? What brand? Uh, I currently play Nikes. You do? Yeah. Are you sponsored by Nike? I'm not. <laughs> I'd like to be. Other than golf, what do you do to unwind? Hang out with, of course, Knox and Carly and sure. Mrs. Reading. And 
Uh, work out, uh, try new restaurants. That's about it. Golf, yard so work. You still yard golf, work. I try to. So there's a lot of people tuning in, as you well know, and of course your team is behind you, Correct. as well as representatives from the fire department. What's your message to everyone tuning in about being a, a first responder, as it were, a public safety professional, one of the um, good guys? I, I think right now, I, I think my message is is just understand that that we have a we have a tough job job to do, and it's it's not always easy on the outside looking in. Um, and I think my, my biggest response is to let us let us do our jobs. <clears throat> you said the same thing to your golf coach, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> did. That didn't work out well. <laughs> Mom, any comments? Nope, just very proud of him. Very proud. I'm very proud. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, uh, I have the honor of reading or administering the oath to you, and of course, as we spoke beforehand, if you'd like to invite anyone to join you while we do so, this is all about you. Chairman, can you just announce who's absent? Oh, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Bruno Kilberg. Yep, just one order of business that I didn't do ahead of time. Alderman Bruno and Alderman Kilberg are not present at the meeting. All the other aldermen are. Mayor, I believe we have one other, another presentation. We do, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to introduce to the uh, Committee of the Whole tonight those in attendance and those tuning in, uh, my good friend Tracy who has a presentation this evening on the Be Smart program, a program that uh, I believe all of you will benefit from, all those tuning in will benefit from. 
It's my honor to welcome Tracy to the council. Hi, everyone. <laughs> welcome. How do I work this? Right. Yeah, just double click that. This? No. Is there a mouse up here? Oh, I didn't see that. Gotcha. Okay, here we go. Let me get this open. So while it's opening, I will uh, take a moment and introduce myself along with, uh, and then Steve will introduce himself. Um, Be Smart, or my name is Tracy Wishers, Mayor said, and um, Be Smart is a part of a group called Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And we'll be taking the time today to discuss the Be Smart program. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a mom of two teenagers and I got involved with uh, Moms Demand Action when Parkland happened. I have a, my son was a junior at the time and he came home and we were talking and we live in St. Charles and he said right out, I don't feel comfortable going to school tomorrow. I've never felt that way, mom. And we just had a, you know, like everyone, sense of hopelessness, helplessness, what could we do? And over the next month I stumbled into Moms Demand Action after doing some research online. And then after attending for a few months, I became involved in the program Be Smart. So that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Hi, I'm Steve McHugh. I live here in Geneva, and I work as a senior vice president for a market research company. And uh, I got involved in the Be Smart and the Moms Demand um, program, mainly because I have, for a number of reasons, but mainly, mainly because I have two daughters who work in schools. Uh, one is a teacher, one is a speech pathologist. And also, I grew up in a home that had loaded and unlocked guns, which is a lot about what this program is about and we'll be talking to you about. Thank you. Great. Space bar. Thank you. Um, so as I said, we're here to talk to you about this program. I'm going to jump right in with some statistics for you. Um, firearms are the second leading cause of death for American children and the leading cause of death for black children. As this slide shows you here, nearly 1,500 American children between 0 and 17 are killed every year with guns. That's an average of four a day. Um, when American children are killed with guns, the majority of these deaths are homicides, about 53%. And then um, 500 children die by firearm suicide every year. And an additional 100 are unintentionally shot and killed with a handgun that, or with a gun that they never should have had access to. We know that approximately 4.6 million US children live in a household with at least one loaded, unlocked gun. While school shootings and mass shootings typically make national headlines, the reality is that for children under the age of 13, gun homicides most frequently occur in the home. And those, of course, may not make the news as big as the mass shootings do. One study showed that nearly 90% of unintentional shooting deaths and injuries among children under the age of 15 also occur in the home. When you think of those statistics, it's, the home should be a very safe place for our children. What's more is we know that an incidence of gunfire on school grounds 78% of the shooters under the age of 18 obtained their gun from a home or the home of relatives or friends. And if that gun had been locked, stored securely away from them, they would not have been able to attain it. This, of course, we all know guns and um, the issues around guns are a very emotional issue. Many of us may be gun owners, many of us are parents, some would never think of having a gun, but we as adults, today need to make an effort to keep kids safe from guns. And that go, that's more than just telling them not to touch a gun. Because we all know how kids are, you tell them not to touch something and that almost increases their interest in wanting to touch it. So we all believe, or we believe in our, in our group that gun owners, most gun owners do want to be responsible gun owners. Um, so that's what we're here to talk to you about today, to gun owners, non-gun owners, um, and this is what we call our common ground in our group. We all want kids to grow up happy and healthy. We each have the right to make responsible decisions about how to protect our homes, whether you do own a gun or you don't. 
Um, and if we can prevent even one child gun death or injury, it's our responsibility as adults to do so. So on this slide, I'm going to discuss several headlines. Some of these you may have heard of, some of you may not. Um, there are different towns across the country. Uh, the first one is back from January of 2018 at a high school in Kentucky. A, um, a shooter went into the school and shot 16 people, wounded two of them. Um, shot 16 people and wounded them. Two of them, unfortunately, lost their lives. Um, the 16-year-old shooter had gained access to his stepfather's unsecured pistol at home and brought it to school, and that's how he was able to make this tragedy occur. Uh, the next tragedy in the upper right corner um, talks about a, Louisiana to a Louisa toddler who was shot um, by their four-year-old brother when they thought the gun, unfortunately, it was a toy, and it was a loaded gun that had, not been un that had not been secured. This happened in May of 2018, and the, the four-year-old shot his two-year-old brother, um, which is a, a horrible tragedy and something that that little boy will have to live with for the rest of his life. And the gun was kept high in an upper cabinet where family members thought the children wouldn't be able to get to it. Fortunately, it wasn't up high enough. The next headline on the lower left is um, after um, a study was done talking to kids in Jackson, Mississippi, and they were talking to different teenagers, and one teenager stated that in their area, they felt they needed to get access to a gun to keep them safe from muggings, um, burglaries, things like that. And so they would look at homes, or they'd be at a friend's house, and if they could grab a gun, they felt better being able to carry that on them than if they didn't have a gun. And then the last story is um, about t teens and impulsiveness can lead to tragedy. This is a story about a 13-year-old boy named Mikey from Brewster, New York. He was a friendly, popular eighth grader, loved to play sports, loved to play video games, hang out with his friends. And in January of 2013, he came home one day, probably after a bad day at school, and found his father's unlocked, loaded gun, and took his own life. His family, of course, was very shocked. They knew him to be a pretty happy kid. He had friends. He was involved in different things. And unfortunately, because he had that access and had that impulsiveness of a teenager, he made a very um, fatal, tragic decision. All four of these stories show the fallout of when young people have access to unsecured guns. No story is quite the same, but they are all tragic and can all be prevented. So we're here today to talk to you about this program called Be Smart that Moms Demand Action developed several years ago. They looked at all areas of what I just talked about and, and decided on these five points that we will discuss with you. And um, I'll just do a quick overview and then Steve and I will go into each, each of these points to give you a better um, idea what it all involves. So, Stands for Secure Your Guns, Model Responsible Behavior, Ask About Unsecured Guns in, ho in Other Homes, Recognize the Roles of Guns in Teen Suicide, and Tell Your Peers to Be Smart. So let's start with the S, which is Secure All Guns in Homes and Vehicles. 13 million households with children contain at least one gun, and the majority of children in gun-owning homes know where their parents or the adults keep the gun. And we already know that in incidents of gunfire on school grounds, many kids find these guns at their home, and that's how they're able to bring them to school. Um, the tragedy that unfolded in Marshall County High School is one of those that we talked about where the kid was able to get a gun from a, his family or relative's home and was able to bring it to school and uh, cause that tragedy. So securing guns, what does this mean? Like we saw in that other story where the family put the gun in a cabinet, unfortunately it wasn't high enough and a young boy could reach it. So securing guns means locking them um, with ammunition stored separately, but locking them in a secure safe that either has a lock, a combination, um, a lot of them can have fingerprints now, but storing these away so that only the adults have access to it. Because as we all know, kids 
don't always listen to what parents and adults say and are going to touch a gun. So this would, if the guns are locked or loaded, locked and, and stored safely, the kids will not have access to it. Um, I talked about the kid from Mississippi who spoke of the complicated safety reasons in their area, in their neighborhood that pushed them to want a gun. Um, keep in mind that, that kids feel a variety of emotions around guns and like I said, from curiosity to fascination to fear. And unfortunately, sometimes that curiosity overtakes the fear and finding a gun um, is not gonna prevent them from using it. So that's where if the, the research we've done and, um, and studies and talking to many families and people locking them like this, this way is gonna be the safest for everyone involved. Um, we also found that uh, storing them safely like this decreases a risk of suicide and then the unintentional shooting that we've talked about too. One study shows that households that locked both firearms and ammunition had a 78% lower risk of self-inflicted firearm injuries among children and teenagers and an even 85% lower risk overall. And of course, that would be involving adults. So. The way to keep your gun locked and stored safely, like I mentioned, is uh, cabinets, storage lockers, there's cables that you can use, a firearm safe. Um, my husband is a gun owner and we have a safe um, that he has the code for and no one goes near that. The, my kids are teenagers, they, they do not have any interest in um, using the cabinet. And my husband also has taken my son out to teach him how to safely use a gun. Unsecured guns can also contribute to a staggering number of guns stolen each year. So this is another reason for keeping them locked, not only to keep them safe from the children, but if your house is broken into, the gun will not easily be taken if it's locked away. Um, this number is staggering of 380,000 guns are stolen from private gun owners every year. And unfortunately they get into the wrong hands at that time. And so, um, like I said, keeping them safe this way, locked in a storage container, lo or vault, a locked safe, um, st uh, storage cabinet, and with a lock that only the adults have access to is really gonna help prevent um, a lot of these unintentional um, gun deaths along with the, the shootings that we hear with kids getting their hands on and suicide. So from here, I will let Steve take over and uh, jump into the M. Thank you, Tracy. Mm -hmm. So the M in SMART stands for Model Responsible Behavior. So every law-abiding citizen has the right to choose to have a gun in their home. But they also, with that right, they also have a responsibility to keep kids safe, keep it out of um, not accessible to a young child who might accidentally find a gun or a teen who may be uh, purposely looking for a gun. Uh, so it is the adult's responsibility on that. As Tracy showed on the previous side, the majority of kids uh, know where the parents store their gun. And in fact, one third of them claimed to have played with the gun or approached the gun without their parents' knowledge. Um, kids are curious, and it's the adult's, adult's responsibility to keep them safe. Um, in fact, kids who have gone through a week-long gun safety training were no less likely to approach a gun or play with a gun than those who did not. Again, they're curious, and they're approaching the guns. Um, but you can't be with them all the time, if, even if you're safe. Um, with the guns, you can't be with the kids all the time. So you need to have that conversation with them on how to stay safe, what happens if you do come across a gun accidentally or, or otherwise. And we do have a handout to talk about this. The A in SMART is to ask about unsecured guns in other homes. So again, you can't be with them all the time and maybe they're going to a friend's for a party or uh, a sleepover or what have you. Um, so we want it to be the kind of conversation that you would have in any other safety situation. So if your kids are going to a party, your teen or young child is going to a party or somebody else's house for something, what are some of the kind of things you would ask, guns aside, 
what are some of the kind of things that you would ask? This is the interactive part of the presentation. Here. So anybody, uh, what kind of things would you ask? Peanut allergies. Peanut allergies, exactly. Are the parents going to be home? Parents going to be home. Who's going to be home? Right. What other kids are going to be there? What other kids are going to be there? Exactly. So those are the kinds of questions you would ask if, um, if they're going to be driving anywhere, you know, who, who is going to be driving, are you wearing seatbelts, do you have car seats, those kinds of questions. Uh, so we would like those kinds of, um, of uh, questions to, uh, to be out there. And to be able to ask these safety questions, ask about a gun in the home. Now, this can be a little bit awkward at first to ask, you know, do you have a gun in the home? So if it's less intimidating to you, you can text or email. The R in SMART is recognizing the role of guns in suicide. So let's just go uh, through a couple of points here. Um, most people who attempt suicide do not die unless they use a gun. Unfortunately, guns are very effective in suicide. 85% of suicide attempts with a gun result in death, a much higher fatality rate than any other means of self-harm. Unfortunately, two of my friends I went to college with had sons who uh, committed suicide with, uh, with a gun. Uh, this contributes to the fact that 40% of child su suicides involve a gun, and nearly half of those who survive a suicide attempt report spending 10 minutes or less thinking about it before the actual attempt. It can be a very sudden thing. It doesn't have to be... Um, yes, this child was depressed for a long time and maybe we saw the signs. It could be something very sudden. I broke up with uh, my boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, I did a dumb thing and, uh, that I shouldn't have done and now it's all over uh, social media um, or whatever. Um, these are the things that we have to be aware of. And as kids get older, we have to be more and more deliberate and aware of these kind of things and making sure that guns don't get in their hands. Some more statistics, a survey, a CDC, um, Centers of Disease Control, survey of high school students found that 17% had seriously considered attempting suicide within the last year. That's almost one in five. Um, one study showed that 41% of adolescents in gun-owning households report having easy access to the guns in their homes. So this is just, uh, again, we have some handouts for some uh, resources that you can go to on this topic. And lastly, the T in SMART is really the power behind the, the uh, Be Smart program, uh, to tell your peers about this. You might have heard some things that resonate with you or things that you can share uh, with friends or family in all of this. And research shows um, that law enforcement, military, hunting or outdoor groups are particularly effective at communicating uh, safe storage practices. Um, we all want to keep uh, people safe. So just to recap, again, uh, SMART is secure all guns in your homes and vehicles, model responsible behavior, ask about unsecured guns in other homes, recognize the role of guns in suicide, and tell your peers um, to be smart. So thank you for having us here today, and uh, we're available for any questions that you might have afterwards. Well, thank you. Thank you. But are there any questions now, I mean, from the, from the dais? Anyone from the audience that has any questions? That was a great presentation. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. We have a handout we'll leave out. Good. Just Please kind of do. Just summarize a lot of what we talked about. Good. Mr. Chairman. Oh, wait. Yes. We do. Please, after all. Is this presentation we'll on city or can it, it will be. It will be. Yeah. Okay. So Thank you. Get a copy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McHugh, may yes. I ask you a question, sir? Of course. Uh, you and I have had the pleasure of meeting before, yes. as, as Tracy and I, and, and your organization. How many presentations have you given? 
on this subject? On this subject. This, well, is, this is my first, I believe this is Tracy's second. Okay. No, I've given, this is my okay. fourth. Fourth, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah I got involved okay. um, yeah. like in December in this part of the part of moms. The Kane Kendall chapter? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. When you give a presentation before adults, mm -hmm. is there a different reception than when you give a presentation before students? And we have obviously many students with us this evening. I mean, right now for mm -hmm. me, it's. It might be easier if you come up oh, to right. the microphone because then people can hear that. So are watching. The, the times I've given it, it's really been um, eye opening for most adults. Yeah. It's a lot of it, when you think, think about it, it's common sense, like lock a gun, it's dangerous. But people, you know, talk, you start talking to people and, yeah, I grew up, my dad had guns like in the basement. They were like, we could reach them at any time. And I never thought about that. Or I never thought about asking my neighbor, mm -hmm. you know, my neighbor three doors down is a police officer. I never thought of asking, do you have guns in your home and are they locked? How do you keep them? Mm -hmm. So things like that. So a lot of it's been really eye opening and, and good conversation with, with people when we give these presentations. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank we you. really appreciate you having us. We do have a question oh. from the yeah. Please, yeah. you have to come up so that, uh, so that everyone can hear it. <laughs> um, do you have any talking points for people, for parents, um, when you get an answer that you don't like? Like, oh, yeah, I do have guns in my home, and right. they aren't secure. They so aren't secure. how do you handle right. that? So, you know, we've talked about that. That's, a, that's definitely a tough one. Um, you can kind of maybe ask then if the, the play date could be at your house um, and just say you're concerned um, with everything you read in the news. That's definitely because it is a bigger topic nowadays than it seemed, you know, five, ten years ago. So that's what we've talked about is, is maybe, you know, changing the venue of where you're going to have the kids hang out and just explain why you're concerned. And then maybe that will give the people some, some thought as to maybe it should be stored. Maybe it should be locked and kept safer. Yeah, and like within the presentation, it's, it's part of any other safety kind of thing. No, right. we don't have car seats for the kids, okay. Right. You know, I'm not comfortable with that or, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It oh, you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I do appreciate it. Uh, the next item. On the agenda is to proclaim May 2019 as Mental Health Awareness Month. I will read the proclamation um, that the mayor has asked me to, and then I'll need a motion and a second to vote on it. Um, whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental health conditions, and whereas mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation, and whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health and other chronic health conditions can recover and lead full productive lives, and whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen shares the burden of mental health problems and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts. Now, therefore, Kevin R. Burns, Mayor of the City of Geneva, Illinois, do hereby proclaim May 2019 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Geneva and call upon all citizens to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health, the steps our citizens can take to protect, protect their mental health, and the need for an appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental health conditions. Motion by Swanson, second by Clemens. Any questions regarding motion? <laughs> and I will. I'll put um, if there are none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, we do have uh, Cheryl Johnson from Tri City Family Services here today. I, I don't know if you have to, to accept the proclamation from the mayor. And if you have some comments, please feel free. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to represent Tri-City Family Services and the current president of the board of directors. And um, Tri-City Family Services has, uh, as you know, some of you celebrated 50 years of service to this community. Um, we are very happy to do that. Um, each year we see more and more people and uh, you know, please go to our, our uh, webpage and, and you'll get a full report from us as to everything that we've done this year.
And it's been um, particularly uh, helpful for people today to understand that mental illness is the same as a physical illness. You know, they're not siloed into two different parts of your body. You know, if you want to, you have to treat your broken leg, you also have to treat depression. So um, I think, you know, just an awareness and the, of the um, destigmatization of mental health is really important. And um, I think we see consequences of the lack of good mental health services services everywhere we look today. So I think we're very fortunate in this area to have the services that we do. Tri-City Family Services accepts insurance. It also accepts Medicaid. And we also have a sliding fee scale for those that are on, uh, not on any of the above. Thank you. Any, any questions? Alderman Ruby. Um, just a, a quick question. You mentioned that you've seen more patients mm -hmm. this year. I'm, I'm curious. I, I could see that as a positive or as a negative. I'm curious for your your view on that. Great question, Alderman, and it is both. So um, uh, you're absolutely right. We're seeing, again, a greater awareness, uh, uh, you know, more people seeking services. And so we see it as um, a positive, that people know that we're there, that, that we're here in the county, and, of course, we see from all over the county. And so um, we think that it's a, a positive step in the recognition of being able to treat mental health. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Mayor, do you, would you like to present this? I would also just like to briefly say I had the privilege of serving on the 708 board in Geneva for several years. And I just want to compliment that 708 board, that group of people on there under Susie Sugar and are just fantastic. And they take their job very seriously and do a lot of research as well as just the other parts of that, that board. And, and with that segue, if I may, tomorrow evening, the Mental Health Board is sponsoring a community health forum uh, as part of the Kennedy Forums on the table, Your Voice Matters event. So tomorrow at 7 p.m., there is a mental health event that we invite everybody to come out and share uh, and help make aware for mental health. Our executive director, Laura Poss, will be here tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. Can we get a picture with Oh, sure. You can airbrush my <laughs> side if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we now have a presentation from the Geneva Cross Country Summer 2019 Norway trip presentation. I believe we have a number of, of high schoolers here to, to do that presentation. So please come up. Please give your name so we can put it in the minutes. So, Ladies and gentlemen, I had the pleasure of meeting some of you outside today, but notice how Mr. Tormod Larson's not taking the podiums. This is all up to you, man. All right. Your coach is quiet back there as well. Hi, my name is Eric Palmquist. I am a junior at Geneva High School. I'm going to start off our presentation here um, and introduce everyone behind me. This is Andrina Larson. She's also a junior, three-year cross-country runner. Uh, Lauren Hasty behind me, sophomore. Colby Coronado, sophomore. Abby McVeigh is a junior. That's Nathan Lehman. It's his first year. He's a freshman. And there's Adam Coates in the tie-dye. He's also a sophomore. And next to him is Josh Branstead, a sophomore as well. All right. My name is Colby Coronado, as forementioned. Um, I have the first part of this presentation. Uh, how would I go about this? Is this a space bar? Yeah, well, you got Grab the mouse and you have to hit the slideshow. Nice. I gotta get it started first. Excuse me? Oh, no, it's just being persnickety. Gabe, you're a cross country guy. Nice push, too many times. <laughs> Are we gonna totally need, broke it. I guess I did. <laughs> Are we going to need the Wizard of Oz from behind the door to... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oops. I don't know what you did. All right, Colby's not coming. Yes, here comes... Here he comes. Here he comes. Thank you, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> scrolling. Yeah, let's just stop. I tried to escape. That didn't work. Let's just kill it and open right. it again. Yeah. <clears throat> Start over all over again. You know, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we have the tech club coming, so it's going to be perfect. 
There you go. There we go. There there we go. All right, now it's space bar. <clears throat> All right. So I have the introduction part of this presentation. The Geneva Vikings cross country team will be um, going to Norway and many of its wonderful cities um, on the days of June 10th through 27th in the summer of 2019. Um, while this is not everyone for the Geneva Vikings cross country team, a few of us have self-funded the trip um, with some help from our parents, but um, some of us had done it on our own um, to raise the money to go to Norway. <laughs> Open hit the slideshow. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. All right, so we will be traveling to Norway, um, one of the many great uh, countries of the Northern Europe area. Um, for the days of June 11th through 17th, we will be traveling to Oslo and experiencing many of the great things that the city has to offer. Um, being the capital of Norway, that's where um, most um, people will be residing as um, residents of the area. Um, we will be visiting as the team to the Norwegian Olympic Training Center as uh, shown up there. We will also be going to attend the Bislett Games during, on the, I believe, the 13th of June. Um, these are just a couple of things that they have to offer. We have uh, um, several activities planned, a couple of um, uh, boat rides of like a tour of some sort. We have um, uh, nature walks and other areas. All right, so I'm going to be taking over. My name is Andrina Larson. I'm a junior. Um, after we visit the capital of Norway, we're going to go further up north and visit where my family is personally from, Harstad. That's what we would say in Norway, but people in the U.S. would say like Harstad, which I don't know. Um, anyways, in the first picture, you can see like the mountains. Um, if you look over, you can kind of see like that big mountain, and then there's kind of like a peninsula. There's actually lake houses up there, and there's um, Viking graves there, too. So, you know, like everyone here says we're the home of the Vikings, but actually the home of the Vikings is in Norway, I would say. <laughs> um, so in Hashtra, it's just like a small city. It's 25,000 people, so it's like the size of Geneva. And then on the left top of the picture is uh, from downtown Hashtra. And then on the bottom is from downtown, too, but it's just a little bit further out. And then on the top right, you see like a cannon, and you're just like, wow, there's just a cannon just there. But it's actually from World War II. Um, further up north, there's a lot of history from World War II. Like, there was fighting there, and the Germans actually had bunkers up there, too. So we'll be visiting some of the history sites they have to offer. And then that's the midnight sun in that picture, because up north, it's 24 hours of light. So it kind of looks like it's a little bit dark, but it's actually light. And we're going to be above the Arctic Circle, so that's why it's 24 hours of light. And then here are some other pictures of the nature. So my name is Nathan Lehman. I'm a freshman. So our final destination on the trip will be to Lofoten from June 24th through the 27th. Uh, it is made up of a cluster of smaller islands up north, uh, northern Norway. and. Uh, as you can see there, very close, all connected. And while we're there, we plan on hiking. Uh, that's actually a soccer field built into the, one of the islands we will be visiting there. So we'll be hiking, uh, very scenic since we're going to be so close to the ocean. Uh, there are some destinations to see. And then it's also a uh, very big fishing village. So we'll, we plan on doing quite a bit of fishing there as well. Now go back two slides if you could. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I don't know. Go back, back <coughs> now go back. Now go forward one. Okay. You ain't going to be doing that on the left, are you? <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I think he's we'll being attached. Right. <laughs> we'll be on the right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. So that's Lofoten. All right, once again, my name is Eric Palmquist. I'm a junior at Geneva High School. We have a variety of reasons for choosing Norway as a great place to train this summer. Uh, it's a great opportunity to learn about a different environment, different culture. There I go, I see those socks. I'm actually wearing the same socks. Are you? It's from a charity race that we yes, do every are. year in August uh, that coincides with our interest squad. First cross-country meet of the year. It's been uh, supporting the charity that the Larsons family run. 
and uh, it's really a great atmosphere. And if anyone wants to come out, it's the uh, Christopher Big Heart, uh, Big Heart 5K, usually in, what, third weekend of August, something like that. Um, so that's uh, one of our connections. Uh, we can learn about another culture and the history. You know, when we, when we think about something historic here, it might be from 1880, but something from 980 would just be scratching the surface out in Norway. Explore our Viking heritage. You can't say that we're the home of the Vikings and claim all this historic Scandinavian culture without really uh, exploring what it is there. And to represent Geneva, represent our town uh, outside of our little sphere here. Um, and finally, it's just to be a great team bonding activity to really get to know each other better and to establish relationships that we hope to maintain for the rest of our life. So there are 14 people attending this trip, both runners, coaches, and chaperones. It is entirely self-funded. We are not getting any help from our school um, because it is, not, it is entirely unlike any other school trip, obviously. And we are seeking sponsorships. This will help us uh, to, to travel um, and connect relationships with businesses uh, and services in Geneva and the surrounding communities um, and uh, just help us really keep our mind off having to pay this on our own while we're on the trip. It's really going to be a big help. So if we have any questions. Have you asked Batavia or St. Charles to perhaps provide us? <laughs> nah. No, not yet. <laughs> Hey kids, <laughs> hey students. Um, how, what type of fundraising have you already done? I'm curious. We have been in contact both uh, electronically and face to face with a couple of businesses. Back in the uh, Snowmageddon, back in February, we did a couple of manual uh, driveway clearing stuff like that to get us started <coughs> and to help the community learn about our, our trip. Um, and, and we're just going to keep the ball rolling and, and as we're all connected and really understanding and getting our uh, our schedule down we can start to understand the needs of what kind of funding we'll need as far as different uh, you know a lot of the I'm sure everyone knows Norway is not a che cheap country to do anything at all so this is something that uh, that the average trip for students about twenty five hundred dollars um, and, and every, every dollar helps us, and it just, like I said before, helps us enjoy, because I know a lot of us are, if we have jobs and stuff like that, I know I'm paying for much more than half of my trip. Same thing with Colby and some of the other students here. Um, it can really, we hope to absorb the culture and, and bring back, and pretty much the closest thing we, closest example to utopia that we have, bring it back to Geneva and hope to utilize some of those concepts. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Um, so I assume everyone already has their passports in hand. And Correct. Yes. What airline are you flying out on? We are on Scandinavian Airlines. Oh, great. Yes. And then, do you does the cross country team hope to make this an annual trip? Maybe not annual, but at least on a on a regular basis. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able we won't be able to accept any of the outgoing seniors this year. So that was a disappointment due to some school rules. But uh, I'm a sh I'm surely hoping that every student that goes through this program has the opportunity to experience a trip like we are going to have um, and and as we are the kind of the inaugural trip we hope to establish relationships with our businesses here that will not only help us throughout our basic seasons but uh, will contribute to some of our further endeavors later on the line and one last question are you going to meet up with any other cross-country teams from Norway yeah we hope to we are uh, right now in the process of making connections with some of the other teams there, uh, learn how they train and, and teach them how we train. Um, and, and hopefully there'll be some of our guides to the awesome trail systems that are around in the area. That's so cool. And definitely ask Scandi Scandinavian Airlines for a big donation. Yeah. If you I haven't think, already. Have we done? Oh, yeah, I think we have, yeah. Okay, that's good. Thank you. That's great. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Do appreciate it. If there's no other questions. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we all appreciate that you're taking the time to hear us today. It makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next presentation, which is.
going to be a little hard to follow after the I other know, ones. I, I mean, <laughs> Trust me. from the Union yes. Pacific <laughs> Metro Third Main Line um, project update. So we will be getting an update on the uh, third rail. I know yes. this is a tough one. You've, you, now you got to follow. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, there it goes again. Ah, uh, here, here we come. Here we come. Solve it one more time. Yeah, no problem. Get out of your way here. This is hanging on me. There you go. Thank you. Well, I would certainly, uh, yeah, what's it? It looks like it's playing something. Is that? Well, I would, I would say Union Pacific could offer transportation to them, but um, we don't go that far. <laughs> It looks like it's playing, but rather than doing a slideshow. Luckily, it's very brief, so. What is it doing? Oh, did you guys have a video before this thing? No. There, there we are. Thank you. Well, good evening. good evening. I'm Lisa Stark, Assistant Vice President of Public Affairs for Union Pacific Railroad. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this evening to give you an update on the Metra Union Pacific Third Mainline Project, which I think several of you have heard about over the past few years. And the project, I think, probably may be new to a couple of you. So to start, I just wanted to... Um, to give you kind of a primer on Union Pacific's Metra operations in Chicagoland. And the, what this first slide really represents is just an overview of the three lines in round Chicago where Union Pacific actually operates the Metra service. So we have the Union Pacific North Line that runs from Chicago up to Kenosha in Wisconsin. We have the Union Pacific Northwest Line that runs from Chicago out to Harvard the line that I ride to Barrington um, most days when I'm in my office. And then we have the Union Pacific West Line, which runs from downtown Chicago out to Elburn and obviously passes right through, right through Geneva. Um, in particular, the West Line sees over 100 trains a day. I'm sure you're very familiar with the, the heavy volumes that we have on that line, which are really a mix between both commuter trains as well as the Union Pacific freight trains. So. We um, entered into a public-private partnership with Metra back in 2008 to do a variety of improvements along this line. And one of those improvements that we are embarking on is adding a third main rail coming through um, the Geneva area and then again out in the, the Maywood Melrose Park area. And let me pull this map up. There we go. Um, and as you can see on this slide, we are actually triple tracked except for in two critical locations, one being from West Chicago to Geneva, the other being from the border of River Forest to Melrose Park, where we only have two lines in place there. So what you see with our rail traffic that's coming in and out of downtown Chicago to Elburn and points on onto the west is we're triple tracked in certain areas. We go down to a bottleneck of two tracks, we go back to three tracks, and then we go back to two tracks, which that really creates issues when we have uh, backups on the line or we have, um, you know, an issue with a metro train or a mechanical issue, we don't have the ability to get around that and keep our traffic moving fluidly. So what we're doing is adding 1.8 miles of additional line um, for that third track, as I mentioned, um, from the border of River Forest to Melrose Park. That project is underway currently. We are actually anticipating that that will be complete by end of September. We'll continue to do some additional signal work out there, but we, we anticipate that that pro portion of our project will actually be in service by the end of this year. So we'll start seeing some benefits from that. And then specific to Geneva, which I'm sure you're the most interested in, we're adding an additional 6.1 miles of third mainline track from West Chicago to Geneva, or a better way for you locals to, to picture where that would be. It's from Crest, from Crest to Peck Roads is where that third mainline track will be installed. We are right now in the final stages of um, our acquiring the properties that we need for that from a variety of property owners in Geneva. I know we also have been having um, discussions with, with the city in regards to some needed properties for that as well. We do anticipate that in July we will put that project out to bid and we're hoping to award the project sometime in the second or third quarter of 2019. 
and we have probably, had a, you know, with that award timing and obviously winter coming coming upon us um, at the end of this year, we probably will be looking realistically at a construction start time of um, second quarter of 2020. And we do anticipate there's going to be about an 18 to 24 month construction window for that project. As we've reported at, at some previous uh, council meetings, we are working and have had very productive conversations with the city such that we are aware of summer and fall festivals that would be occurring in town so that we can try to accommodate those, especially with traffic circulation, because obviously we're going to have to, you know, there's going to be a lot of construction going on and we will have some intermittent, um, you know, impacts to the existing uh, crossing locations in the city. So we're keeping a close pulse and working with city staff on that. Um, and I mean, for the most part, we're about, we're moving forward in the permit process. We have one more permit to get from the Corps of Engineers for the project that we anticipate is coming any day now. We're checking our, <laughs> checking our inboxes for that. Um, but you know, we have, um, obviously worked with the city for, I've been working on this project for three and a half years. 11 years, okay, so Stephanie, 11 years, I can't, I can't beat that, but I will, but I will tell you, we've had a great, a great partnership. We really appreciate it. Your staff's been absolutely fantastic to work with, um, you know, I wouldn't, the word accommodating, I wouldn't say, I would just say responsive because there's obviously been things, you know, issues that we've had, that we've had to work through such that there could be a win-win on both sides of that, but we certainly appreciate the city's support and recognizing what that third track means for our freight and our commuter fluidity. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I also have um, Rick Conrath with me tonight, who's with Benish, and he's been our, um, our project design manager for that as well. So if you have technical questions, he's, he's the guy. So I'm happy to answer, and if you have some. Any questions? Alderman McGowan. Thank you, Chairman Marks. Hi, I'm so sorry I didn't catch your name. I just Lisa, Lisa Stark, with two eyes, L-I-I-S-A. Oh, thank you, okay. Um, so I'm curious, why is it that there are those two areas that only have the two tracks when the rest of the line is has three tracks? You know, we inherited that railroad when we acquired the Chicago Northwestern. I honestly don't know back in the day why we wouldn't have had the full triple track all the way through there. Um, and, and to be honest, there may not have been a need for it. You know, we acquired the, the Chicago Northwestern back in 1995-96 time frame so the world has changed since then technological innovation has allowed us to to operate differently uh our what we're running on that track today's probably looks a little bit different than was being run on there you know over 20 years ago okay thank you also um up there on the screen it mm -hmm. says that there's a 188 million budget for this project and the split is 56 44 is that between the geneva location and the one further east, is that what that means? So so what that represents is, as I had mentioned at the beginning of um, my presentation, was just that we have um, entered back in 2008 into an agreement with Metra to do four different projects all along our West Line corridor. So what that entailed oh. was we did some station and safety upgrades, we did some signal system modernization, we installed new crossovers so that trains could more fluidly uh, change tracks, and then the last portion of that agreement is this third mainline construction. So when that's said and done and when that last segment is completed here in Geneva, we're anticipating that the overall project spend would be $188 million. For, so for everything you see up there, the, the third mainline project itself, the eight plus miles of new track that we're putting in is about to the tune of 112 plus million dollars. Got it. And that's a that's a obviously a big investment. The split for that is the 56% UP, 44% Metra. They've been a, they've been a, a great partner with that. So it's you know it's a, a public private partnership for that investment. Okay, just so I understand, you said that. Um, uh, the 112 million is the cost of this project. What is what is the 188 then? So that's the total of the of all the four oh. phases of our total agreement okay. with okay. Metro. So it includes the other the other projects that have were previously completed. I understand. Yeah. Okay. And I've asked this question before, but um, is there going to be an increase? in train traffic right so there's no anticipated increase in rail traffic on that line right now um metro's not we're looking to add trains freight trains we're not looking to add trains on that line this project was always about fluidity and being able to move what we move today more efficiently 
um, such that we don't have idling trains sitting in neighborhoods. And what happens here with, um, with us operating the Metro service is we actually have two train curfews per day. So we really don't operate freight trains twice a day, once from, uh, from 6 to 9 a.m. and then again in the evenings from 4 to 7 p.m., such that we can allow for that rush commuter time for the Metro train. So what we see what happens with that six hour time frame that we're not really moving our freight trains is we see a backlog going back out into, you know, really out into Iowa. So this is really, again, the efficiency so we can get the trains into Chicago more fluidly and quickly. And just as a, you know, an anecdotal type of thing, you know, the trains, you know, that we run have hundreds and hundreds of cars on them. Um, and if you're adding more trains, I mean, that's a large volume of additional product that's moving on the railroad. Uh, we don't, you know, we tend to ebb and flow with what's happening with the economy, and we just don't see a huge influx of one product that's going to all of a sudden have to be moved. I mean, our, our, our book of business is very diversified, so we may see an uptick, for example, when you have a lot of housing starts. We may see an uptick in lumber moving, but at the same time, we may see a decrease in coal running. So it really kind of balances itself out, balances itself out and keeps our train numbers fairly um, steady. Okay, and the length of the trains, the, especially the freight trains, is projected to remain about the same, or do you see those getting longer? So we are we are in the process of evaluating our entire network and looking to see how can we be more efficient with what it is that we're moving today. How can we serve our customers, you know, on on time and get them the products that they need that helps build America every day. Um, we are. I don't anticipate right now that we're going to see much change because we're already running trains along that corridor that have been, you know, the same size for, for quite a long time. Um, and I, that's probably been a change that we've seen over probably the last 18 months or so. So what you're seeing there today will probably be what we continue to see. Okay, so again, um, it's anticipated right now that the this project would sort of be completed in the summer of 2022. If I'm doing my math correctly, yeah, 18 to 24 months. I mean, that's oh, of course given months. you know what we have going on with weather, right? That always is yeah. go is going to be impactful. But if we start construction in Q2 of 2020, you know, you're looking at 18 to 24 months after that. So it could be, um, it could be a probably a 2022 completion. Okay, thanks mm -hmm. for everything. Any other questions, Alderman Clements? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and speaking with us tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if this is too detailed of a question for this presentation, but um, I'm sure, as you're well aware, a lot of this is going to be this work is going to be done right up against people's homes, going through neighborhoods, um, and I'm just wondering what kind of work hours. I think, in theory, you you could work 24/7 if right. you choose to, um, but that would obviously be very difficult on the people that live along these lines. Um, so do you have any idea what type of hours you're planning on following or is, is that something that you can't answer yet? Well, we'll be able to, I mean, that will be more definitive once we get a contractor on board and they do it. But I can tell you, we've been doing all the work on the, the Eastern segment on that during regular daytime business hours. We have not had any conversations about that changing. Obviously, you know, that is impactful, especially if people are, you know, trying to sleep. So we have to do it with, obviously within the windows that we can get it, you know, get in there and actually do the work. I don't know, Rick, if there's anything to add to that. I, uh, I would say probably just there may be certain times like when the, we have to set beams across Route 31 that would that will be dictated by the Department of Transportation when you can close the highway and things like that but by and large I think it would be daytime and the same same with the river crossings they have to do it when you know when that can be done so okay right. thank you any other questions Alderman Burkhardt. Uh, will there be, uh, thanks for being here and giving us the update. Um, will Metro commuters see much of a impact during the construction period? No, I mean, we, they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, we do work along our tracks all the time. We have inspect inspection cars that are running out there every day. We're replacing ties. I mean, it's a well-oiled machine in terms of that, so they should not. What they will see, though, at the project completion, you know, if we have, for example, you know, a mechanical issue on one of our trains, and it stops on a track and it's blocking 
I'm sure everybody who's ridden the train into downtown has experienced this at some point where it, it delays every train that's coming behind it, right? This will give us the ability to move around those types of issues. So we really think that that will help with, um, you know, with on-time performance and service. Um, I'm sorry, did you have something? No. Anything about the parking? I, <laughs> I don't have the most recent update, oh. but here you're right. That's a good a good point. Just in terms of what's going to happen with with the parking arrangement during during construction. Right. Par parking will have to be phased. We have to construct the new the new bridge out at lot. I think I call it lot three. I think east of Illinois Route 31. A, a portion of that will be closed to the public so that we we can get in there and safely build the retaining walls and and the improvements there then the lot here for a period of time will be shut down because the new track will be constructed on the south side and you can't safely do that construction with automobile traffic coming in and out so metra is working diligently to uh, provide temporary parking and, and those types of situations that's part of why an additional level was placed on the parking deck to accommodate that and so there will be parking impacts short term while the project is being constructed yes. but why other than that they really shouldn't see and I, I was a West Line commuter for a number of years as well and they completed a project kind of like Lisa said over between Elmhurst and uh, Bellwood and it was right adjacent and no no impact at all to train operations it was noticeable so very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you. <laughs> Any other? Alderman McGowan again, if there's no one else. Thank you. Um, regarding the Fox River Trail, mm -hmm. will that be closed we, at all because of the construction? No, we anticipate at this point that there will be access to that available throughout the project. I don't know if there's any portions of the project that we were able to work around that to keep that access open okay so even the um my next question the fox valley marathon i think they use that and would that event be affected at all by the construction they're aware of the construction uh we've kept them informed so as far as we know they they're making whatever arrangements they need to make okay that's good um i did have an okay sorry go ahead <laughs> the the south leg of the uh, at South Lake access on the west side of the river will be detoured, but there will always be access to the trail. Oh, that's great. Okay, that's good to know. And something, oh, um, adding the third rail, um, you know, and if you're familiar with the Geneva Metro Station, um, commuters are constantly walking back and forth over the tracks to get from like the parking area to maybe go into the station to buy their tickets and vice versa or you're on the platform and the announcer says okay actually your train is coming on on the other side so everyone has to scoot over to the other side quickly but um, what kind of safety um, measures are put in place for pedestrians during construction and then once the third rail is there and maybe people just aren't used to the fact that they now have to kind of look in I don't know, it kind of is silly, but accidents happen because people just don't look both directions or under, under, underestimate the speed of an oncoming train, especially a freight train. So um, what, what changes or safety signage or anything like that um, is going to like be installed? They're very detailed maintenance of traffic plans for pedestrians as well as for uh, the automobile traffic so that they are directed you know to the safe routes through and around the uh, project I think the the, the diversions are done here right mm -hmm. the platform diversions to take people away at the crossings get them behind the barriers so when the trains are approaching you know they, they can't be they can't get trapped so to speak in between the track and the gate the, the platform diversion take them out and around and that will continue to be the case with the new improvements so um, it, and, and I've seen cars you know that are in a hurry even now they drive around a, a gate that's down um, and I can imagine that with construction 
it will cause maybe more traffic, um, especially if you're closing off um, a north-south route, then the other north-south access points over the tracks are gonna be more congested and more drivers may be tempted to go around a, a railroad gate that's down. So um, what kind of deterrents are gonna be put in place to prevent you know, accidents from happening? So we, I mean, as as Rick had, had commented on during, you know, obviously during construction, there will be appropriate detours that are established for, you know, pedestrians as, as well as vehicular traffic. Unfortunately, across our entire system, we work so hard to try to change driver behavior so they don't go around the gates. Um, but what we will be trying to do is to limit the, ex the extent of the closures as much as we can. And I believe for the, the closures that we have to do, the updated time frame that we're anticipating those at Western, it's at third, right, right here. And then the Route 31 is going to be the duration of the closures. Oh, the duration. For those. I think we're, we're looking at eight weeks, I believe, for third, third and for Western. And uh, we projected, I think, 16 weeks for Route 31. But that one, that one, there will be a, a lot of variables there that are contractor driven that we don't control in design right now. So that could be longer or shorter depending on how the contractor builds the bridge. Well, the Route 31 crossing, I guess, doesn't really matter because right. cars are going underneath the tracks Correct. or just not yeah. using that road at all. So then it's just the Western Avenue and then Third Street. Yes. And I'm sure the Geneva police have already talked about this or considered it. So. Um, but I think it would be great to have like security cameras and a sign saying like, you know, if you try to cross, we will kind of like a red light camera, but that's just me. So I'm not sure if that's something that's been done or. We always appreciate partnerships with our local law enforcement agencies to help enforce, I mean, really to help enforce crossing violations. That's a, a huge tool for us. But you know, you've brought up something and I'm, I'm gonna ask the city if, there's a, if it's possible to either put something in a newsletter or put something on the website related to the project as it comes up and maybe include a link even to our website that talks about rail we safety. We currently have a, a page on the website yeah. dedicated to this and we will continue to update that yeah. with, with all of the information. So. I mean, again, I don't think you can rule out stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> but we do sir, absolutely appreciate your concern about safety. We share that with you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Alderman Ruby. Can we just get a, a quick uh, PSA on what, what, are the, what is the law with the crossing? If, mm -hmm. if the gate is open but the lights are still flashing, that's oh, you, you've you got me because I'm a mom and I talk to my children about this every <laughs> time we come up to a railroad crossing. So the law is that if the gates and so <clears throat> in order to proceed at a railroad crossing, once the gates and the lights are have been activated, you have to have, <clears throat> excuse me, the gates have to be completely in the up position and all the lights and flashers have to be off before it is legal to proceed. And so. what is the fine if... The state of Illinois, I think it's upwards. I'm going to look at my. Yeah, it was increased a few years ago. The state, the, the the legislature increased the base for those fines, so it went up. I would I would trust my law enforcement partners over there. Yeah, that that would be a good reminder to include with mm -hmm. our information. Thank you. Any other questions? Alderman McGowan again. Okay. Also. Um, what about like people know they're not supposed to stop on the tracks, you know, in a traffic backup. Sometimes a driver will anticipate that there's enough space, but now with the all of the traffic being condensed more into onto um, two out of these three crossings, with one either Route 31, um, Third Street, or Western Avenue being closed. Um, you know, I could see more drivers thinking they have enough room, but then all of a sudden traffic comes to an abrupt halt and then their, their car is kind of stuck either fully or partially on the tracks. So do we already have signage um, saying like, do not stop on the tracks? And if not, can that be I don't, I don't put in place? Do you think, do, do we have I've seen it in other communities. I just don't recall if it's 
over there. I know it's in my community, and people still stop in the middle of the tracks, and it drives me absolutely crazy. But, <laughs> but that may be something. I mean, that's not something that the railroad has jurisdiction over. Um, we'll take a look at it, but I think too we need to make sure that we're respectful of the construction and the safety guards that they put in place for the construction that they're required to put into place so that so that everything is you don't miss things because you're trying to add more signage which takes away from the signage to deviate from the construction zone so I mean I think the railroad I think Lisa would would agree that safety is of their utmost importance absolutely I mean we're talking about doing safety improvements to the Western Avenue crossing for pedestrians through this project that's one of the things that will come out of this project. They did the safety upgrades not too long ago at the Third Street, again, for pedestrian safety with the, another train coming, warnings and all of that. So I think that is certainly of the first and foremost of everybody's okay. mind. Yeah, I guess I would definitely like to request that if it's possible, put up the signs that say, do not stop on the tracks. Or just if it's not too much information for people. I think it's something that would be good for the city to look into doing. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any more. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. We do appreciate it. Next item on the agenda is to approve the regular committee of the whole minutes from April 22nd, 2019 and special committee of the whole minutes from April 15th, 2019 and April 29th, 2019. Motion by Clemens. Second. Second by Ruby. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, items of business. Um, consider suspending the rules to allow Alderman Marks to chair this meeting and vote on all actions item, action items on this agenda. Motion by Alderman McGowan, second by Alderman Burkhart. Use the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Um, the next item is 4B, consider draft resolution to sell surplus publicly owned properties for the gross amount of 646813 including compensation for temporary construction licenses on parcels A, B, and C to Union Pacific Railroad Company. Do you have a motion? Yeah, okay, we do. do I so, motion? so moved. Motion by Burghardt. Second. Second by Clemens. Um, so in the interest of time, the next four items are all related to this third main line project, which is one of the reasons we had uh, UP here this evening to give you some background information. So the first item is authorizes the sale of property to the UP um, of not less than 80% of the appraised value. Uh, this is land that they needed in order to, to complete their project. And I'm, if you don't mind, give me a little leeway. I'll just talk a little bit about each of them and then you can move forward. The next item is temporary construction licenses. So these are areas where the railroad needs the property either for staging or for some other purpose for a short period of time. <coughs> We're not actually selling them the property. We're just kind of giving them a lease for a period of time. And then the last two items relate to the relocation of electric assets and segments of a, wa a water main due to the project. As the assets are located on city property or within easements, the cost of relocation is an eligible uh, reimbursement item by the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, the city attorney has reviewed all of these items, so everything is in order. Uh, some of these items have been negotiated items. Other items are per an agreement. So again, all four of these items are directly related to the third main line project. We do have additional questions. We still have Lisa Stark here with us. We also have Director Babica, who I think stepped out. Uh, Superintendent Wright's here, and certainly I can answer any as well. Are there any questions on item 4B? Seeing none, uh, voice vote is okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? This is unanimously. Item 4C, consider draft resolution approving the execution of temporary construction licenses to the Union Pacific Railroad Company. So moved. Motion by Clemens. Second. Second by Alderman McGowan. Um, any questions, comments? None seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimously again. Item 4D. 
consider draft resolution authorizing execution of a reimbursement agreement between the Union Pacific Railroad Company and the City of Geneva in the amount of $373,048.86 to relocate certain electric division assets between South Third Street and the Fox River. Uh, motion, please. So moved. Motion by Burghardt. Second. <coughs> Second by Swanson. Comments, questions? I guess a question for Hal. Go ahead, is there any benefit to this what we're doing is this we're only doing this because of the railroad project or is there any benefit yeah, that's, we're that's, getting that's it? pretty much the whole of it it's, it's almost a hundred percent due to the railroad works gotcha. and some of it's coming overhead to underground if you think that's a, a benefit then yeah, there's that benefit but other than that we wouldn't be pursuing it unless pursuing this, yeah. no. okay All right. thank you any other questions? Hearing none, seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 4E, consider draft resolution authorizing execution of a reimbursement agreement between the Union Pacific Railroad Company and the City of Geneva in the amount of $119,563.22 to relocate segments of a water main behind Brigham Court. Brigham Court. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Burkhart. Second, I need a second. Second by Alderman Ruby. Comments, questions. Alderman McGowan. Have the resident have the residents been notified of this work? Mr. Babica is coming up. Director of Public Works. This is a 16 inch transmission line that basically shadows the south side of the Union Pacific Railroad tracks and does not impact the residents, uh, their water services or any other distribution. So there really was no need other than to give them a notice that we were gonna be working in their city property that is adjacent to their property. Okay, yeah, cause it looks, it looks like um, the houses on Brigham back up to the tracks and those are the ones that would kind of be aware of construction going on but you said that they were notified those residents were kind of notified yeah the their property doesn't trip back up to the tracks there's actually a fairly significant city-owned parcel where this water main is located so it's their help their property the city-owned parcel then the railroad right away and we were working on the city-owned proper parcel okay but you you did mention though that the residents were notified mm -hmm. that the okay with like a door hanger or a combination um, of door hangers and uh, notices that were mailed out okay just in case we get any questions thank you so much <laughs> any other questions none seeing them all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed Obviously. Uh, item 4F, consider draft resolution listing exempt development slash projects for the revised Kane County Stormwater Ordinance. Need a motion? Uh, motion by Alderman McGowan. Do I have a second? Second, second by Alderman Berger. Questions, comments? I'll just uh, but then briefly. We'll go to you. <laughs> uh, so, Kane County Please. is updating the Stormwater Ordinance. As part of this process, developments or projects that have been previously submitted and that the city has approved their stormwater plans can be exempted from the new ordinance and completed under the existing ordinance only projects that have completed that have been completed and approved a stormwater review are eligible for this exemption uh, in the packet tonight lists those projects that would be eligible and so this resolution is just requesting that we make those exempt from the new ordinance so that basically you're not changing the rules midstream they know what they're required to do and what they have to do and you're not having to change the rules. Uh, if there's additional questions, we do have Director Bybica to answer those. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Alderman McGowan. Oh, thank you. Um, I did notice that it's. it seemed like all of Northwestern Del Nor Hospital was included as one whole entity as being exempt instead of just like one little project at, or sorry, one project at a building at Northwestern. So. How does that play out into the future? So Northwestern is a, is a PUD, so their whole property is considered one big project, and the little projects within it, as long as it complies with their PUD, so that's why they're exempted okay. or are proposed to be exempted. All right, makes sense to me. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Then we'll vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 4G, consider approval of certificate of acceptance for Campbell Row townhomes at the southwest corner of Campbell and 4th Street. Do I have a motion? 
So moved. Motion by Burkhart. Second. Second by Alderman Clemens. Okay. So this is a certificate of acceptance for the public right-of-way improvements and sanitary sewer main to accommodate the Campbell Rose subdivision as stated on Campbell and 4th Street. Uh, with the certificate of acceptance, the remaining balance of the corresponding letter of credit supplied by the developer can be released. So essentially our engineer is saying they've done what they needed to do. Comments or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 4-H, consider draft resolution authorizing bid award and purchase of materials for 2019-2020 underground electric cable replacement from Wesco in the amount of $44,145.35. Do I have a motion? Motion by Alderman Swanson. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Alderman Burghardt. Sure. Uh, so for this one, staff solicited and received four sealed bids for materials for the underground electric replacement program, which is included as in the approved fiscal year 20 budget. The work is to take place in five locations, Center Street from Anderson to Grant, the Mews and Kinston Courts, East State Street from Longview to Kirk Road, and Route 31 and 3rd Street and Dunstan Road south of Fargo. Uh, staff is recommending the lowest qualified bidder uh, as Wesco. Um, and then again, if there's additional questions, we do have Superintendent Wright with us this evening. Any questions? All right, then. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 4I, recommend draft resolution authorizing the city administrator to declare surplus vehicles and equipment as presented. Do I have a motion? Double. Motion by Alderman McGowan. Second? Second. Second. Second by Alderman Ruby. Okay, so we recently compiled a list of vehicles and equipment that are no longer utilized. Uh, the list is in your packet. The resolution would authorize that all these items be declared surplus. Any items that have a resale value will be either sold at auction um, or however we dispose of them, and the proceeds are returned to the appropriate fund. Comments or questions? Hearing none, seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, we are down to new business. Public comment. Is there any new business from the day? It's Alderman Clemens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, all the city staff, especially Public Works and Police, with everything that happened with that water main break, or I should say, breaks. Um, I heard very little complaining about that. I think people knew everybody was working very hard on it. It was I was astounded at how quickly it was resolved. Um, so, on top of everything else you've dealt with over this uh, endless winter, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Any other new business from the dais? Alderman McGowan. Thank you, Chairman Marks. I just wanted to mention something. Um, I've been speaking with some residents in the fourth ward who've been dealing with AT&T uh, construction. They're installing the fiber optic lines. So um, it's it's been disruptive, but um, I just wanted to um, recognize AT&T when we met on Saturday morning at Northern Illinois Food Bank for our annual city council retreat with the city staff. I noticed a large group of AT&T volunteers working, um, and, uh, sorting donated foods. So I went and spoke with a few people and learned that AT&T is actually one of the longest running volunteer groups at the Northern Illinois Food Bank, which of course is located here in Geneva. Some of the volunteers I spoke with had been our at t employees and they've been coming every Saturday for over 20 years. So it's really quite impressive. Uh, the ladies I spoke with don't even live in the area. They live maybe about 45 minutes to an hour away. So, um, and the woman that I spoke with who was a who was at the front desk of the food bank said that AT&T is by far the biggest volunteer group that um, comes and helps with the sorting of food at the food bank. So I just wanted to mention that I think it's very commendable of AT&T employees to do that. So they are giving back to the community. So thank you. Thank you. Any other business or comments from the dais? Any from the public? Please come forward. Uh, name and address now. <laughs> uh, sure, sure. Hi, um, thanks for 
having me. Uh, my name is Sarah Schaefer. I live at 2837 Miller Road in Geneva. Um, we've lived here about a year and a half. So um, somewhat new residents, but I'm from the area, or not from the area, but have lived in the area for almost 20 years. Um, I actually had a question about one of the things about the Western Avenue thing. Is that should I have asked it back then, or can I still ask about it? Okay, um, so uh, it actually, this is not what I came for, but um, actually just last week I was sitting um, at the, while there was a train, and I noticed um, that at the sidewalk there's no um, gate for uh, pedestrians, and those trees are pretty, which is ironic because my other thing is about trees. Um, the trees are really tall and you cannot see at all. I know the trains are loud, but like there's a park there and the pools there and I just, it just There seems. is some pedestrian safety enhancements planned for the Western Avenue. I don't know the specifics on them, but that is a big topic that the city had talked about cool. that we needed improvements for that. That is fantastic because I, listening to all the other talk, I was like, oh yeah, it's kind of appropriate. <laughs> it just came up. Um, okay, so the reason I'm actually here, um, <clears throat> I've actually, I think I emailed with my alderman um, probably a couple months ago, just briefly. I wasn't really sure where to, um, how I was supposed to go about this, but um, <clears throat> I noticed when um, Fresh Time and At Home came into the area, excuse me, I'm so sorry, <clears throat> Um, when they redid all of the, um, the landscaping, uh, one day there were lots and lots of trees and the next day there were like no trees. <laughs> um, so when, uh, when that construction happened, um, it was kind of shocking when um, literally dozens and dozens of trees were taken down and over the course of the last couple months they have definitely made improvements. The landscaping looks pretty nice. Um, it looks very nice, but there's still um, a lack of trees. Um, and considering the rest of the corridor has um, a lot of beautiful trees and mature trees, I just, I would just propose that there'd be some something put in place that possibly more trees could be planted. Um, I live directly behind um, Fresh Time and at home. So there is a large row of trees there that kind of is a buffer um, to our neighborhood, which is nice for noise and for light purposes and um, traffic, you know, um, when cars come in, like the headlights. Um, I recently noticed that there were other trees that were cut down um, right by like O'Reilly's, O'Reilly Auto Parts and like the Vane Clinic. There are about four or five trees cut down and I was happy to see last week that they planted some there, like to replace them. So. I'm just hoping that that might be something that's in the works um, to replace some of the trees, excuse me, some of the trees that were taken down um, during that project. So, um, I, and I just wanna say that um, I think that the beautification in Geneva is wonderful, so I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about, um, um, about our town and our city because I think um, everybody does a wonderful job, but if there could be just a few more trees that's what I came for. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other new business or comments? Alderman Cowell? Is it appropriate for me to reply to that briefly? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would recommend, um, Sarah, that you contact David DeGroot, who's on, or you can find his information on the city website. Um, it's DeGroot, and I can write down the uh, name later or after the meeting for you, but he can do the best. I can kind of reiterate some of it, but he can um, explain really, really well the pro um, the trees that were cut down. Um, the property owner, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, they had to either pay money to the city of Geneva to be used to plant additional trees elsewhere in the city um, um, along parkways or and I think that's yeah. what it was so it I'll was just, like Stephanie you can as part it? of the as part of the plan for that development there was a landscape plan that the city council did review and did approve and with that the removal of the trees was approved but they did have to pay into the tree fund or plant additional trees there's it depends on the type of tree and the class of tree 
Um, so, so if you need more information on that, David DeGroote is certainly the appropriate party. But there was a, a landscape plan that came along with that development. And so by removing the trees, they can't just remove them. They actually had to either plant certain other plants or pay into the tree fund. So they're not necessarily planting trees in the area. They're just planting trees in Geneva. They, what they do is they contribute to a tree fund so that the city can then plant tree, uh, oh. trees elsewhere. Elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So. So, but they, but they had to have a landscape plan and it had sure. to be approved by the council and that was all So done. it's not a city of Geneva area. It's like their, Correct. their property. Correct. It's okay. property. So that's helpful to know. Yep. So then they're just gone. But I think, I think as, as time goes, you'll see that some of the plantings that they plant will mature. And, and, and yes, it's not going to be your high trees. Yeah. because. And I understand why they removed some of them for the visibility. I totally get it because they were really, really large. But um, OK, well, that answers, at least answers my question. So thanks. Thank part, and part B of my comment was um, I'd be interested in just asking the property owner if they would maybe consider putting in some trees that wasn't a part of the original plan but the landscaping that's in there is very low to the ground and um i don't think you know it can hurt to ask like would they consider planting some things in the residents really miss the trees a lot of those residents are their customers and it wouldn't be something that totally blocks the view of the stores people know that the stores are there but I think there could be like a compromise if they would just be willing to consider that. I think it would be nice. I'd be happy to ask them myself if I'm able to get their contact information. So just something, exactly. There's all different sizes of trees. So I think it's a really wonderful um, thing to ask. And I'm glad that you came to the meeting tonight. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other business or comments? Hearing none, seeing none, I need a motion for adjournment. Motion by second. Alderman Ruby, second by Alderman Burghardt. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Meetings adjourned. Microphones are off.